you know, I didn't ask him to do that. Okay, I, I live by a rule that I got from Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. I know you're all familiar with him. He was uh, the leader of the Moravian Brethren and uh, was responsible as the vehicle that God used to bring John Wesley to faith. And uh, he said a lot of good things, but one of the things he said that I, that I just, I love and I'm trying to practice, and it's this, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. <laughs> now you chuckle, but the whole point is, is that our legacy is Jesus. Our legacy is our gospel. My wife is here today. Uh, I would tell you that the best sermons I've ever preached have been my marriage and my children. And I hope that that is, if that's a legacy... It's all about Christ's faithfulness to us. So, some of you are wondering, I guess this isn't Philip de Corsi. He doesn't have that wonderful accent, <laughs> right? That I've always felt that those who have a, a, a Brit or Irish or Scottish accent, they're just smarter than the rest of us. Don't they just sound that way? <laughs> but Philip really is. And so when he emailed me and said, David, would you come and speak? I, quite frankly, I was shocked. Uh, humbled and honored, because he's, uh, he's one of my heroes. He's a great man. He's becoming a good friend. And to, you know, share the word with his people is really a joy. So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 4. We're going to look at what is uh, probably the first parable, not that Jesus told, but it's the first one that we know about. And it sets the tone. And when I speak at various places which I do from time to time, I always bring that congregation something uh, about where my own heart is. So I've been wrestling with this parable for the past two or three months. And I, I want to come to you today as a, as a fellow traveler on the journey. Because this parable, it's, it's, it's about the heart. You know, in uh, Proverbs 4.23, we are admonished... Watch over your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. You know, back in the day in the ancient world, if you had a spring, it was life. If it got fouled, if animals fell in it, or if enemies came and put something in it that was bad, I mean, you, you, you didn't have a way to live. And so the, the proverb writer here, Solomon, you know, the first Nine chapters are all about his primer for life to his son. And he's saying to his son, look, your heart is like the spring that feeds all the water that you have here in our land. That's your heart. And you better watch it. You better take care of it. The Puritans called it heart keeping. Why? Well, in Mark 7, some guys came to Jesus and said, I know I said Mark 4. Don't turn. I'll just tell you Mark 7. Okay, you, you with me already? Okay. I know what you're thinking. This guy isn't Philip. <laughs> and, and I've been thinking that too for some time. But you're, you're wondering, oh, Lord, please don't let him be boring. And if he is, don't let him be long, right? So I, I will make you this promise. Uh, I will be done preaching before you're done listening. Is that fair? Not all of you, because I've lost some of you already. But. <laughs> but in Mark 7, some men came to Jesus and said, hey, how come you are letting your disciples eat without washing their hands? Isn't it amazing? There are always auditors in every generation, right? Some of us, I'm included, I have a propensity to be an auditor. And I try to suspend that. But this, these men came to Jesus, and this was his, his response. Don't you understand? There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. That is, defile him spiritually. It is what comes out of a person that defiles him. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart, come evil thoughts. Sexual immorality, theft, murder. He gives a whole laundry list here. Adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And they defile a person. Remember when David 
And David looked out on his, from his housetop and he saw Bathsheba, who probably was the daughter of one of his friends, a daughter that he had probably watched grow up. Think about that, how that kind of complicates things. And you have to ask yourself, as I do with those that I counsel with and cry with after they've had a, a moral downfall, I ask them, you know, you've you got to get to the place where you realize that your heart is so broken that what you did, you thought was okay. How do you get there? Well, David got there somehow, and when Nathan the prophet came to him with God's word and it, it, it smote him, the old word, he writes Psalm 51, doesn't he? And he says, I've sinned. I've sinned against you, God. You only have I sinned. And then in verse 10, he says, create in me a clean heart. Right? A clean heart. Which obviously means that at some point he had let his heart get dirty, filthy, divided, compromised, polluted. And here he was, a man supposedly after God's own heart. For you do not delight in sacrifice, he said, or I'd give it. You would not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Most of us hate to have a broken heart. But there are times in our lives where God needs to break our heart. Now, what is the heart? The heart is, uh, a lot of military guys would understand this, it's the command and control center of the person. It's, a, it's the archive of your convictions. It's where you stack up your beliefs, including your preferences and your prejudices. Right? It, it, your heart is the, is the library of who you really are, with all those different volumes that have memories in it, have bitternesses, have long-held grudges, things you can't forgive. It also has the loves of your life or in your heart. The things you like and don't like, all the way from, you know, Rocky Road ice cream to the Rams, excuse me, um, I don't know who, all the way up to your family. It's all of that. So if we could take your heart and put it up on the big screen, we'd know exactly who you are. That's what the heart is. But the heart's a problem. Jeremiah told his people, the heart is deceitful. Have you ever thought about that? You can tell yourself stories that your heart kind of manufactures and come to believe them. I've been uh, thinking for a long time that uh, I need to do some more investigation and maybe even some preaching and writing on this. We, we sing that God has saved us from his wrath, right? God saves us. We are saved from the wrath of, wrath of God by the grace of God for the glory of God. But somehow we have to get in there that he is in the process of saving us from ourselves. Justification, I know you know this, is that monergistic, that one force work. God alone justifies. But sanctification is the process whereby he, he takes our practice and brings it into alignment with the position that we have as children of God. And that practice, that, uh, that movement from who I was to cr who Christ is, is a cooperative movement, right? The Holy Spirit is the agent whereby we are being transformed. The kingdom of God, as someone has said, is a relationship. And the more you say, I want the kingdom to come, your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, what you're really saying is, God the Spirit, keep working in my life. Keep transforming me. Well, I think the, the heart is the root of all that we are, and sanctification should be an ongoing passion that starts with the heart. So that's why I want to talk to you about the sower and the soils. And I know what you're thinking. Dave, this is just about evangelism, right? The sower and the soils. Oh, it is that. It is that. But uh, remember that Jesus, well, we can read it. Look at Mark 4. And he began to teach beside the sea. This is up north in the Sea of Galilee. And the very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. Okay, so this is the first time that he's doing this parable teaching. And we, we know this 
if you've been around the church as long as anybody, as long as I, I tell people I've been in church since I was knee high to a hymn book. <laughs> My dad was a great Baptist pastor up in Spokane, Washington, and he taught me I'm a Baptist born and a Baptist bred, and when I die, I'm a Baptist dead. <laughs> in case you're wondering, my dad weaned us on the Puritans. So I, I was hearing about, you know, Richard Baxter and Thomas Manton and all those guys, John Owen, before I actually really even knew who they were. They, they were just part of the family, and I thank God for that. But my dad would preach this, and it was always about evangelism. It was always about when you're out amongst the unbelievers, realize that only some of them are going to have hearts that are prepared by the Holy Spirit to respond. But as I'm studying this, I don't think my dad's wrong. I never think my dad's wrong, <laughs> although he knows everything now. He's with Lord. But Jesus is here preaching to a group of people who are following him, because they've seen the miracles that he's done, and they are religious folk. These are the people of God. They think they're okay with God. And I'm coming after you and me today, because so do we. And I think that this passage talks not just about four kinds of, of unbelievers, but I think there is a sense in which he's talking about four kinds of hearts. And here's my confession. I have them all from time to time. I'm hard-hearted. I am shallow-hearted. I can be, have a divided heart. And the, the, the point is we want to strive to have that fourth heart. That is, the rocks have been removed. The roots have gone down deep. It's, it's soft to the word. So we look at this, and in verse 3, he says, Listen, behold, the sower went out to sow. Now, I, I think it's kind of wrong for the folks who put the Bible together to call this the parable of the sower. Because we don't know who he is. We don't know anything about him. We just know he's throwing seed. So I really think it's about the hearts. But I do want to ask you, who is the sower? That's because this is the question I've been asking. And if we go a little further, he says, the sower went out to sow and he as he sowed some seed, and we've got to ask what the seed is. And if you go over to verse 14, you're going to have to be a, a biblical athlete here and move around. The sower sows the word. So we can tell who the sower is by the seed that he's sowing. Matthew calls it the word of the kingdom. Luke calls it the word of God. So what we're really talking about is the seed is anytime the word of God falls on your heart. could be through your private reading could be as you sit and listen to a sermon. It could be in a Bible study. It could be as you are driving around and, uh, and you're thinking, you're regurgitating something that's been said or read, that this whole idea that your heart is being uh, seeded. Now, I would tell you that the number one sower of the seed is the Holy Spirit. Okay? And this is why I think that not only think, I'm, I'm desperately in love with this, what I'm about to say, that God, the, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to do the work of God in our lives. And the speed and the efficiency at which that work gets done has everything to do with the condition of my heart when the seed is sown. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Dave, this is pretty self-serving. You're a preacher. You're just telling us we need to prepare. Yes, you do. If you're going to use the time to come into a service like this, why not prepare? Why not pray? Uh, there's this great song that we sang at Grace Baptist last week. I wish I knew the name of it, but I'm sure Tom does because he knows all things musical. <laughs> we sang it. It says, Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Bring the presence of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Now get this. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. I've been praying that. I prayed that for you this morning and for me, that the Holy Spirit would make the Word of God come alive in us. You know, here's the thing I've learned. You can't coast your way to excellence. 
You can't coast your way to greater maturity. You can't coast your way to greater likeness to Christ. It's work. It's preparation. Right? It's making your heart what it should be. So the first soil we see in verse 4, as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and devoured it. The second one, other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. When the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into the good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And that's where Jesus stopped. Okay, I mean, he just stopped. And, and who knows what the people on the shore were thinking, but we do get a sense of what the disciples were thinking. Because after it was over, after the service ended and all the visitors went to the visitor tent and everybody got in their cars and went home, it looks like Jesus and the disciples got together and they had one great question. Verse 10, when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. I mean, you can imagine that, right? These guys all want Jesus to come out and be seen as the guy. He's the Messiah. Look at all the miracles. The previous couple chapters are all about all the healings he did. And that's why he drew this crowd. And, and so his handlers are saying, look, if you're going to run for Messiah, we got to announce. Right? We, we've got to go. In fact, in John, they tried to get him to go to Jerusalem. Because if you're going to do anything politically, you've got to do it at the capital. And so they're, they're trying to push him here. He says, why are you speaking so cryptically? Just come out and say, hey, I'm the guy. See that rock? Threw in the sea. All these things. Well, we know from other texts that Jesus didn't come to be king. He came to be the suffering servant. He came to die. He had a different agenda. And so he does say to them in one of the most, I don't know, hard to, uh, it's not hard to understand, it's hard to take. In verse 11, he said to them, to you, has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. You see that? To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. We could launch into a full-fledged, reformed viewpoint of God's sovereignty and salvation, but Mark doesn't go there. He just keeps going with Jesus. To you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, and here's why. And he quotes in the Old Testament that indeed they may see but not perceive. And I'm going to tell you that the first three soils hearts are talked about are not just unbelievers who are in that position, but it can also be true of believers who every time the seed falls on us, we have an opportunity to understand it, to perceive it, to accept it, to let it do its work in our lives. But sometimes we have hard hearts, shallow hearts, divided hearts. And so we hear, but we don't understand. We see, but we really don't perceive. So we get to verse 13, and he's going to talk to us about these four hearts. And Please understand, I, I'm, I'm going through this with you, okay? Uh, I haven't preached this sermon at Grace Baptist. I've been working on my own heart, and I'm just rehearsing it with you. Because this hits us where we live, dear ones. It really asks us, do we really want to be more like Christ than we already are? Or is good enough good enough? Well, it's not. We know that. So let's look at these hearts, and I'll leave it to you to apply it to your life through the ministry of the Spirit. The first one, he says, in verse 14, the sower sows the word. And there are, these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes it away. You guys know that my countdown clock just went off? Thank you. So these are the ones that are sown along the path. And you remember in Matthew 5, Jesus is doing uh, the Beatitudes, and at the end he comes and says, you are the salt of the earth. And the salt loses its saltiness. It's not good for anything except to be trampled under people's feet, thrown out and trampled under their feet. Well, what he meant was is when the salt gets done doing its deal, 
you know, they packed the fish around it from the Sea of Galilee for its trip to Nazareth or wherever. And when their salt that was holding the fish loses its saltiness, guess where they threw it? On the path. And in those days, the fields would have paths going through them because the paths were usually there first. They were ancient, the old paths. And, and people would walk those paths to get various places, and then they'd throw the salt on there, and it kind of became like a paving stone. And that salt would get into the soil, and it was kind of like Roundup. Nothing would grow. But because the paths skirted the field or went through the field, the sower, who had a lot of acreage to, to sow, he was indiscriminate in sowing it, wasn't he? He just threw it everywhere, and so some landed on this hard-packed soil where there was salt and nothing could grow. And he says, this is kind of like your heart. At times, i got to tell you, I've had a hard heart. People closest to me know that. Sometimes it's because I think I know everything already, right? Some of you laughed because you know me. <laughs> Hebrews 3.12 says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Now, I don't believe we fall away fully and finally, but I do believe that believers can turn away. But we can say, I know that's what the Word says, but I'm too busy to really reflect on that. I, I don't want that to get down in, in my heart. I, I know what that's like. For a period of time in my life, I sold chocolate for a living. I know. Sorry. And I made 70% of my income, which was really a great income, by the way, selling Easter eggs. I knew Easter eggs were a perversion of Resurrection Sunday. But I didn't let myself think about it, right, because I... Like the money, yes. I repented of that and got into ministry. Now I preach against Easter eggs. No, I don't. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. True story. Sometimes we look at the word and we're hard-hearted toward it. Let me give you a couple of causes of that. One of them is just neglect. Neglect. We just don't read the Bible. And if we do, sometimes it's just to check off the boxes. Right? We've got a Bible reading plan in the back of our Bible. We open it and we read a chapter here and a chapter there and a chapter here and a chapter there. And then we feel like we've done enough good for God to be obligated to give us what we need. By the way, I would like to suggest to you that you no longer read if you do across the Bible. I'll get in trouble for this, but that's okay. Uh oh, it came back on. <laughs> you know, the idea of I'm going to read a chapter here and then a chapter in another book and then a chapter here and a chapter here. That would be like reading six Shakespearean plays, you know, one scene from each. I think part of the problem we have, if we have a problem in the evangelical church, is that we've forgotten the whole flow of the Bible, the whole story of the Bible. That's why Philip and I preach expositionally. We want you to understand that it is God's story, and it is cohesive and consistent. Read across the Bible. Sometimes we don't read at all. I read an article by uh, John Piper. He said one of the, the first red flags that we are neglecting God's word. And by the way, remember, it's the tool that the Spirit uses primarily to make us more like Jesus. So we don't want to neglect it. Piper says one of the big red flags is when you're no longer desperate to read God's word. Can you identify with that? Do you have a desperation? I hope you do. Another one can just be pride. It can be, uh, be being preoccupied. I used to do my, you know, my daily Bible reading in my office, the study at Grace Baptist Campus. And I'd get there early and I'd get in and, you know, I had, I had to read the Bible. I'm a pastor. It's kind of, you know, you're supposed to. And you read it through in a year or however long. And I found over time that I'd get in and I, I open my Bible and I'm reading what I'm supposed to be reading, except that in my mind, I'm thinking about the appointment, I'm thinking about the sermon, I'm thinking about the elders, I'm thinking about, you know, the people in our church who have cancer and ALS and all the other things. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I've read whole passages, whole chapters gotten done and couldn't tell you what book it was. Dear ones, don't do that. That's a hard heart. We want to hear the word. 
There's probably a lot of reasons we don't. We want to recognize what God does through preaching and through his word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, you know, I'm so glad that when I came to you and preached the word, you, you didn't accept it as the word of man, but for what it is, the word of God, which is at work in you. The seed will do some work, but not if it lays on top and never permeate, permeates it. And what it says that Satan immediately comes and takes away, I have no idea. Ask Philip. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, we find, in, in, oh, back in verse 5, uh, this, is, uh, this is what I call sallow, the shallow heart. Immediately it sprung up since it had no depth of soil. This is a, a, a common occurrence in Galilee where there's, there's strata of rock that are four or five inches under the topsoil. And over in verse 16, these are the ones sown in rocky soil, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure f- for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And again, I'm, I'm not seeing falling away here as, as, you know, in the Christian's world, as the full final falling from grace. We know that doesn't happen We not only believe in the perseverance of the saints, more importantly, we believe in the perseverance of God in his saints. So the idea here, though, is that you can turn away, I think. I've seen people do it. I've done it myself. There are times in my life where I don't really like what God wants me to do. And so I turn away. Now, what he's he's talking about here is the fact that there's there's a sense in which when we read the Bible or we hear a sermon preached or we're part of a discussion Something hits us. It's really good. It's tweetable. Okay? It's, what do you call it? Instagram? <laughs> Jason, we're going to have to tell you what that is later, okay? <laughs> we put it out there because we think it's cool, and then we, we kind of forget it. But it's neat. It's exciting. But notice what happens. There are rocks in our hearts for some reason. And when the seed germinates and goes down and it hits that rock... It turns back up into almost nothing, and then the plant produces a foliage. That's where it sends all its energy. It sends all its energy into show rather than substance. Boy, this is a dangerous one, you guys. This is a dangerous one. These are the the folks who just, just love the church, and they love the Bible, and they love the music, but they're shallow. They don't see the benefit in putting their roots deeply down. If somebody ever asks them to, do you believe in the Trinity and why? Do you believe in the deity of Christ? Do you believe in the sovereignty of God and why? And does it have a functional practice in your life? They don't want it. They want depth. If I hear this one more time in the church, I think I'm just going to resign and start selling life insurance. Here's what it is. Oh, I'm no theologian. Dear ones, we're all theologians. The question is whether you're a good one or a bad one. We all have to do with God. His his eyes are all over the place. Our hearts are open and laid bare before the one before whom we have to do, right? We live quorum Deo. I had to throw in a little Latin just for you folks. That's all I know. Before the face of God, we are theologians. We are deeply Involved with the God of the universe as his children, as his followers. We need to know him and know more about him. And it's not just theologically, it's biblical knowledge. You know, we should never say, you know, somewhere it says, although the writer of Hebrews said it that way, we need to understand the Bible. Notice what happens, these who don't have roots. They endure for a while, then when two things, tribulation and persecution. What does that mean? Well, tribulation is when life gets hard. Persecution is when people get hard. I have a newsflash for you. This is a broken world. Are you like me that sometimes you're surprised that everything doesn't go just as we should, as it should? I was in a home uh, on Thursday. Family in our church, uh, good friends, this couple, they're in their 80s. They went to Israel with us a few times ago and we really got to know them, got to love them, beautiful people. She has cancer, and she's, she may not last another week. And I visit her in her home. And if you've ever visited someone who's in the final stages, you know, the, the hair is gone, uh, most of the body is gone, 
The ability to speak is mostly gone. And I was talking to her husband, and he's just come out of a deep trough of anger at God. He said, you know, we, we prayed that she'd be healed. Why, didn't, why did God do this? What's that? It's tribulation when life gets hard. Hey, here's the thing. God never promises trial-free living. What he promises is to use that and to show us that the way we respond to it, the way we respond to it is what he uses to make us more like Christ. Uh, let me talk about death since I'm already 62 and probably, you know, closing in. <laughs> right? Probably closing in. This life's just a prelude to the next. Just a, just a, a little introduction. Like the... The band, you know, they play a few measures and then we come in. Those few measures, that's this life. That's why in 1 Peter he says, look, fix your, fix your hope entirely on the hope to be brought us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, we're just here for a little while. And the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Do you, do you realize the fact that the flesh and blood we have now, we have to be released from it in order to inherit the kingdom of God? So when tribulation comes, those who are not have their roots deeply down into the truth of Scripture, into an understanding of God and His attributes and His love and His grace in a deep way, what happens? Well, it says they don't have any root. When tribulation and persecution arises on account of the Word, they turn away. They, in this case, this friend of mine, he, he turned from a robust faith in God and trust in God to a questioning faith, which is okay as long as he answers the questions well, which we're helping him to do. The second one is persecution. That's when people get hard. Well, that's a given, isn't it? It's a given. If you live in this world and you are conspicuous for Christ, there will be consequences. Paul said, uh, you know, I, I, took, I found great honor to suffer for Christ. Now, I, I'm not going to ask you to take a hammer and hit your thumb with it, you know, just to say you're suffering. But please understand that whatever God asks of us is always the best option for us, right? I think Piper said it best. We'll be most satisfied when he is most glorified. And he'll be glorified in us more and more as our hearts are receptive. So what's the answer to the shallow? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. You see, there's a one another in component to sanctification, we're part of a community. We are teaching and admonishing one another through our lives and, and through our, you know, our counsel and through our friendship and through our laughter. All of those things help us to become more and more like Christ, and that's what we really want. To grow deep roots, you know, the Word of God has to find a welcome place in my heart. I have to have a, a desperate desire to drink the pure milk of the Word, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, that we may grow by it. I just, I just wonder sometimes as I look over the church, do we want to grow? Or is good enough good enough? I, I don't think it is. It's not in my life. I'm hoping God keeps working on me, although it's painful. Work to keep your heart soft. Number three. You still with me? Now, when I say with me, I don't mean do you agree. You don't have to agree, okay? I understand that. I just want to know, I say that because then if you twist your head, you wake up, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Number three is what I call the divided heart. What it says in verse 18. And others are those sown among thorns. There are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. In other words, the seed doesn't produce what it's meant to, to produce. The Word of God falls on our hearts. We actually take it in. Uh, I have this theory about preaching on the weekends. We, every week you come and you hear these great sermons, and by the next week it gets replaced by another great sermon and another great sermon. I actually think exit signs, you guys don't have them. That's a good thing. I think exit signs 
are, are the devil's way of sucking out of you when you walk out all the good stuff the Spirit wanted you to get in here. We walk out and immediately, I'm so thankful football's over for a number of reasons, not least of which is I'm a Washington Husky fan, okay? But it's better than, well, I won't go there. <laughs> but I think sometimes we, we come in and we share, we, we sing these great songs, um, and we hope that the Spirit of God plants them deep in our hearts and we remember things. I love the one we say, it, he said, you're my savior from my ruined life. Did that hit anybody else? Was there something in the music this morning that hit you? And we hope you wrote it on the inside of your eyelids, right? So as you're sleeping, as you're dreaming, God is still using that. Do you want that to happen? You see, we can be divided in our loyalties in our hearts. And that's what this third one's about. Notice he says there are three things that can really keep us from allowing the Word of God to, to deeply penetrate in our hearts and start working and changing us. He says there are three things. First one of the cares of the world. Cares of the world. What do you care about? You know, there's a story where Jesus and his disciples show up at Mary and Martha's house. Remember that? Probably unexpected because suddenly Martha thinks, man, I got, I got to prepare food for these you know, these 13 guys and maybe a few more. So she's in the kitchen and she's cooking the appetizer and then, you know, the sides and the couple main dishes. Um, you know, she didn't have gluten-free back then, but they didn't know about it anyway. Well, and where's Mary? Mary's at Jesus' feet and she is listening. Wouldn't you be? Well, let me use this illustration. When you're reading the scripture, when it's being preached or when you're thinking about it, and when you're discussing it at a Bible study, when you're teaching it to your kids or talking to somebody at work about that, you know what, in some ways we're sitting at the feet of God the Spirit who is trying to use that in our lives. And so you remember Martha came out to Jesus and said, Jesus, would you, here's Mary, she's sitting here doing nothing, would you tell her to go in the kitchen and help me? And you can just hear it, can't you? Jesus goes, Martha, Martha, Martha. You are bothered and worried about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. Now, he doesn't tell us what it is, but we all know, right? At that moment, what is most necessary, and doesn't mean you shouldn't cook and keep your car up and, and watch your finances and, 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 you know, be interested in politics, which I think is... More and more a losing game anyway. But you, we get all excited and bothered and worried about all these things. I love Chuck Swindoll's take on this. He said, Jesus was going, Martha, Martha, you're worried about so many things. We only need one. Just bring the soup. Okay? <laughs> Just keep it simple. But what can we draw from that? Jesus says the cares of the world can choke out the word. So what do we do with that? Does that mean we don't care? No, it just means we put them in the right place. And everything falls underneath the priority of sanctification, of cooperating with God the Spirit as he uses God the Word, uh, God's Word to do God's work in our lives. That we're intentional about it. Now I know I keep running over the same cat, right? I've run over it ten times. I'm just hoping that the Spirit of God will take it in your life. And some of you are going, thank you, Lord, this is what I do. I, I'm so glad for, for reaffirmation. I love my time in the morning with my cup of coffee or whatever, and I'm, I'm reading God's Word, and I'm making notes, and I'm asking questions, and, and it's so great to be in this group of four men, and we get together every Saturday morning or whatever it is. Some of you are going, I'm so glad I've been trying to tell people about this. Others of you can hardly wait till I'm done because the Spirit of God is jabbing you right now and you don't like it, please understand, whatever he asks of you is always your best option because he only has your best at heart. Well, he says a couple other things. I won't go hard on him. In verse 19, the deceitfulness of riches. Now, believe it. Philip and I are not against wealthy Christians. Right? I, I, I just remember Dr. MacArthur saying once, Lord, if you give me wealth, give me character first. Because if you give me wealth first, it'll ruin me. 
And that's what this is being talked about. Riches are deceitful. Why? Because it insulates us from any sense of daily dependence. We don't have to pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. We have freezers full of bread, although we can't eat it anymore, right? I miss bread. <laughs> we're insulated against daily dependence by our wealth. And if we're not careful, our concern about money, it can begin to identify us and we can place our security in us. But we find out in 1 Timothy that it can go away like that, the deceitfulness of riches. And then the third thing he said, in case there's anything he left out, the desire for other things. Cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, desire for other things. In other words, idols. Things in my life that I am more passionate about than I am about becoming more and more like Jesus. Well, there's a fourth soil, praise the Lord. Verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it. Isn't that simple? They hear it and they say, Lord, this is, this, I need this. Yes, you're using a file to, to rub off some sharp edges that I actually take pride in, but Lord, if this is what you think I should do and this is how you think I should act and this is the kind of person I should be, and you've given me the whole idea of generosity in order to offset the deceitfulness of riches because if I give some away, uh, I, it's less and less likely <laughs> that I'll depend on it. And Lord, I want that. I want so much that, as Paul said, either by life or by death, you shall even now be glorified in my body. I want so much to be able to say, you know what, I've found that in any situation I'm in, to be content, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to be able to say with Paul, let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. Do your work. So what does it take to be this good soil? Number one, it's got to be soft, not hard. Right? It's got to be soft. It's got to be deep. Uh, life is hard. We live in a broken world, and uh, no legislation or new tax policy or new politicians or new anything is going to fix that. We are in the valley of the shadow of death, not just physically, but all kinds of ways. And he asks us, do not be afraid because he's with us. And so we learn to handle tragedy, not without grief, but certainly never without hope. And the world will understand that, and they'll look at us, and they'll go, what's wrong with you? And then we'll tell them. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, right? I might start preaching here any minute. <laughs> Deep, not shallow, and pure, not divided. We accept it. We welcome it. Let me give you just three things to do. Number one, double down on purity. And I don't just mean sexual purity, but guys, I do mean that. The websites you go to that you think no one knows about, it is ruining you. It is making your hard heart hearted, hardened. It just is. But I don't just talk about that. I mean, purity in your life, pure motives, pure speech, pure plans, uh, pure kindness, not manipulative, but pure, pure confession, pure openness, pure transparency, the kind of people that we all want our kids to be. Double down on that. Say, Lord, I, I'm going I'm to look into the closets of my life and I'm going to get rid of things, advertisements I long to look at, stories I long to read, jokes I, I long to hear told, television programs or whatever that I, I really, if I am honest, they're not good for me. Those are just mine. What are yours? Double down on purity. Actively pursue humility. Now, I, I don't just mean, I mean humble before God. First Peter tells us, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may what? He may exalt you. It's that paradoxical road, right? If you want to be first, you must be last. If you want to be great, you must be a servant of all. Very difficult here in the United States. Very difficult in Southern California, where success 
is seen as, as being the type A person, the guy who's got courage and goes for it and has, we don't call it pride anymore, what do we call it? Confidence. Yeah. Lastly, you know what it means when a pastor says lastly? That he still has four minutes and 36 seconds left. <laughs> Would you pray about making loving and obeying Christ your one great passion? I've got a lot of passions. Grandchildren. Aren't they great? God reward for not killing your kids. <laughs> Somebody said, if I knew how great they were, I'd have had them first. <laughs> I love my grandkids. I love to talk about them. I hope I love Jesus more. Sports. I love it. Who doesn't like Sports Center? Okay. Politics. I, gotta, I tell the people at Grace Baptist, I don't talk politics from the pulpit, but if you see me afterwards, I will tell you everything you need to do and vote. <laughs> News. You know, the advent of social media, man, we are, we are addicted to news. I've got to tell you, I, I've had to stop watching the news because it presents problems to me I can't solve, and I keep thinking about them. And pretty soon, I'm mad at people I've never met. <laughs> Health. You know, some of you are, you know, in the last uh, quarter of life. Isn't it amazing how the topics of discussion turn to health and what, what hurts and what doesn't? <laughs> Hobbies. Music. Younger set, man, music's everything. Uh, I, I read the list of Grammy winners. I don't know any of them. <laughs> who are these people? I'll tell you who they are. They're the ones who are investing in our youth. They're the ones who are discipling, not always in the good way, our youth. Travel, cars, ministry, preaching. I'm passionate about preaching. And if I'm not careful, preaching becomes an idol. Preaching becomes something about me and not Jesus. You know, I have three audiences today. You. Philip. <laughs> right? Because who wants to be the guy who comes to Kindred and Philip comes back and asks, so, how'd Hague do? And gets a horrible answer. But I've been praying for a while that my number one audience today would be Jesus. You are his people. We are the sheep together of his pasture. He is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And all I'm trying to do today is try and be a good spokesman for him. Does my daily desire to grow in Christ top everything? That's a battle. It's easy to say. It's tough to live out. My hope is that we'll all be able to say yes. Father, thank you for your word. You preserved it down through uh, millennia for us. It was not written to us, but it's certainly written for us. And the Spirit of God can use the Word of God to do the work of God in our lives. And we get to cooperate in that. Help us to do it well, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.